Testing, testing, one, two, three. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Attention, everyone, attention. Okay. All right, so first of all, I would like to kick off tonight by thanking the Port of Tacoma for hosting the Executive Leadership Series. So thank you for that very much. And then I would also like to remind everyone gently to please silence your cell phones and electronic devices so it's not an interruption tonight. And then for any questions throughout this, uh, you can ask it to our guest speaker. Uh, but of course, please raise your hand and then we'll bring the microphone to you. And the, the reason why that's important is so that they can hear you for our streaming services tonight. So if you have a question, be happy to repeat it or anything else, uh, I'll bring you the microphone. So tonight's guest speaker is a PLU alum. He's from the class of 74. He was a math major. He got heavily involved in electronics, computers, and storage. Um, when he was here and when he graduated, Ricky Building and the Morgan, Morgan Learning Center were not even a thing. They were not here. They, there was bushes and grass here. <laughs> so a little fun fact for you. Um, but he, he has a passion for electronic devices storage and has been involved in court cases um, several times over. He has been an expert witness, offering testimony, writing expert papers in regards to flash drives, memory, uh, CD-ROM storage, and other electronic storage for computer devices. Uh, he serves as an independent consultant uh, regarding these storage devices and has even helped with consulting with independent companies such as Nook and eBook readers. Ladies and gentlemen, I offer you Brian Berg. <laughs> Give him a warm welcome. <laughs> uh, great, great. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for that warm welcome. Thank you to Dr. Lee for inviting me and very happy to be here. So like what was said, uh, this building didn't exist, and um, this is kind of the hinter hinterlands. I think it was kind of swampy or wasn't much here, but it's great to see a beautiful building like the uh, Ricky Center and the Morgan Center here, and I'm uh, happy to have contributed to those when those were built. And so, anyway, it's great to be here. We're going to be talking about a lot of different topics, and I hope I'll be able to weave a story that's interesting and that you'll learn some things that you didn't realize before that'll be insightful in many different ways. So, um, let's see, this should go. Wait a minute. This was working. Uh, is this not turned on? It's not working down here either. Oh, okay. It's got to be selected. Yep. yep. There we go. There we go. Classic problem. <laughs> I've seen that before. Anyway, so I was born in Japan. My parents were missionaries there, and um, so this is a picture taken of me on the right, and my parents were missionaries in the middle row. The two people in the middle row on the right are my father and my mother. So um, that's kind of an interesting story in itself, but uh, here's some pictures from Japan. I still have one of those kimonos. And uh, anyway, it was just kind of interesting. They, they were missionaries there from 52 to 56. And so I came back on the ship. This was before the age of the jetliner. So when you traveled overseas, you took a ship. So it took a week to get uh, from Yokohama to Honolulu, another week Honolulu to San Francisco, which is where we came back to the US. So uh, this is my family now, my daughter Natalie, who's in the, in the back up here, and then uh, my late mother, my daughter Elizabeth, my wife Joyce, myself, and my late father. So anyway, this is how he looked back in the day. <laughs> so I've very handily covered up my social security number. Back in the day, it wasn't a big deal to reveal your social security number, but it is now, of course. So anyway, this is my old card. And uh, I used to write for the morning mast. In fact, I had some really fun times. I wrote a 
review column, I'd re review record albums and concerts and stuff. I got to interview John Denver. How many people know who John Denver is? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. Okay. Anyway, he was, he was very popular at the time, and so I got to interview him after the concert, and that was quite an experience. It was like sitting down with an old friend, just down-to-earth guy, and really, really, that was a really fun experience doing that interview. And um, uh, probably the biggest thing was when the Beach Boys came in 1974, they did two, two concerts. After the first concert, I interviewed uh, Mike Love, who's pictured here, and after the second show, I interviewed Car the late Carl Wilson. And Mike Love talked about being with the Beatles in India and visiting with the Maharishi. He was really kind of a spiritual guy. He was just like, it was, it was just kind of, we took you weaving through this, a journey um, of his life, and it was just a fascinating interview, so I'll always remember that. So um, this was uh, a, contest winner, a contest that I kind of won. My mother used to enter contests all the time, and she actually entered my name in a contest for a trip to London for a rock concert. And I, quote, unquote, won that contest, and so I got to go to England for a concert back in 73. So anyway, that's my passport picture back in the day. Uh, so I graduated in 74. <laughs> Look a little bit younger there. And um, when, I got, uh, when I graduated, uh, uh, first two jobs, one of them was for NASA Ames Research Center down in California. And uh, this was back before the space shuttle flew. The key thing about the space shuttle is it only had one chance to land. And so, you know, if you're in an airplane, you could have, you know, potentially try to land again, but only one shot for, for the space shuttle. So as a result, simulating the landing was an extremely important part of uh, developing the space shuttle. And so we hooked two mainframe computers together and simulated the space shuttle. And so what they did, um, now we have computer-generated graphics. You can see all sorts of whiz-bang things. Back in the day, we had a camera moving around a board uh, that had literally little hills on it, little trees. So it's as if you're actually flying around terrain. Then they would simulate fog, and then the camera would have moved to another part of the board, and it's as if you're coming in for a landing. That's back in the day before it's possible to do all the computer-generated things that we can do today. So that was kind of a cool part of it. They, two mainframe computers and a six-degree freedom simulator, and, and what I was describing with the camera is what it took for that. So that was kind of an interesting project. I also worked uh, for Ford Aerospace, um, working on satellite communications. And that was kind of neat, uh, doing the ground station software for, for um, these actually uh, top secret uh, satellites that they were building. Then um, while I was doing that, I took classes at Stanford. Stanford had this instructional television network. Now you can take classes online all the time, but back in the day they had a special television network set up with cables going through the ground, uh, connecting Stanford to a number of different um, business locations around the San Francisco Bay Area. So I was actually, actually able to take classes and interact live uh, in those classes. That was, that was pretty neat, and they paid the tuition f uh, for me as well. Uh, one of the th things I remember the most from that was uh, a class from Dr. Vint Cerf, who uh, is kind of, he's called the father of the internet because he invented, uh, with another fellow, the TCP IP protocol, which is critical for, for the internet. So he had a class on operating systems, but half of it was on networking. It was very insightful, and he, now he's the internet evangelist at Google. So he's a very well-known guy, so it's, it's a very interesting experience. So after that, then I went on my own. So uh, I started a company with some friends called Digital Software, and I was, uh, did consulting with that company for about six years, and I've been with my own company, Berg Software Design, since 85. So these are the business cards from the day. And um, so ba back in the uh, mid-'80s, I started working with optical storage. So this is before... Um, Disk drives had very much capacity. Disk drives were really, um, you'd have like maybe two or five megabytes or something like that. They had optical storage, like 12-inch disks that could hold a gigabyte, and that was a really big deal. This is like, I'm a, I tell people this, and they just, they wouldn't believe what, when, how much storage that was. So that's kind of like a given. You can have it on a thumb drive now for like 32 gigs or more. So anyway, it was kind of fun. So this is just a little image on the left showing what it takes to, to read and write uh, optical storage. You basically take a laser, and depending on how much light is reflected back, that's differentiating a one versus a zero. So, um, so I worked on uh, optical storage uh, systems for a number of years, and so I got into data storage that way. It was a really interesting area that I've been specializing in ever since. And um, the first project I worked on was actually they would take digitized x-rays and store them on optical disks in, in these big, what they call the optical disk libraries. So these, these libraries had hundreds of disks in them, and that's how you'd archive data. Now, that much data you can fit into, like, just a desktop computer now. But back in the day, that was a really big deal. 
And uh, sorry, worked on other kinds of optical storage, including compact disc and CD-ROM and DVD and eventually Blu-ray. So uh, that was kind of the basis for how I got onto the storage uh, end of things. And I um, ended up having, over the years, a number of uh, clients uh, in, my, in my consulting work, a lot of startups that you probably never heard of, but some of the key companies, their logos are up here. So I've, uh, I've really enjoyed consulting because um, when you're a consultant, you work for a lot of different companies and get experiences uh, seeing different work environments. I also like it because you never get involved with the company politics. You're independent of that, and then you do a job, and you go on to another company. So it's a really big part of it. Once you get a full-time job, you'll learn about company politics. <laughs> so anyway, so it's, it's been kind of a fun ride. And uh, as was mentioned, some of the work I've done also has been as an expert witness. So I've been able to take the, the technology that I've learned about, and I've been able to um, uh, call into legal cases with regard to patent infringement or trade secret theft, and based on my knowledge of how this technology works, offer an opinion. So when you're an expert witness, or actually I should say in a legal case, there's uh, two key kinds of witnesses. There's fact witnesses who will testify about the facts in the case. There's also an expert witness who will provide an opinion about certain aspects of the case that are in dispute. So that you'll often hear, if you hear stories about uh, key legal cases, you'll hear about the expert opinion of somebody uh, that'll be considered in the case. So I've been able to do that, and that's been quite, quite interesting. You, you learn about a whole different side of the world when you work with attorneys, but it's, it's some of the brightest people I've ever worked with have been attorneys. So in the process of doing that, um, uh, staying busy as a consultant, it's important to promote yourself, because if you don't promote yourself, you won't get work. So, that, so um, in the process of doing that, uh, I, I uh, contributed to a number of books on uh, optical storage as well as consumer electronics. So all of these books I've either written chapters on or edited the book or whatever. So that's been a good part of promoting myself as a consultant. And i um, also been involved with a number of conferences over the years. These are logos for some of the conferences, and um, that, that's been a great part of it too. So if people get to know you in the industry, if you're on your own, and if you speak at conferences, people figure, well, you must know what you're talking about. So it's, a, it's easier to find jobs if you get that kind of exposure. So I found that to be really beneficial to stay uh, busy as a consultant. Uh, one of the things I got to do back in 2015 is speak in Beijing at a conference on flash memory. And I got to visit the Great Wall with a friend. And some of the architecture in Beijing is just amazing. This is like the CCTV building on the right. And it looks like somebody bending over. It's, there's kind of a joke about that building, but it's like 50 stories tall. So Beijing is a pretty amazing town. So um, just uh, th some of the things that uh, have, have happened over the years have been so many changes in the technology. I just want to sh uh, show you a little overview of how flash memory has impacted so much of that, because so much of my work uh, as of late has been involved with flash memory. And um, for example, cell phones, they used to have flip phones, now we've got uh, smartphones, and people just take these things for granted. But there used to be, um, they, they were really limited in their capabilities because you couldn't really put a disk drive into a cell phone. The original iPods had a little tiny disk drive, but putting a disk drive in a cell phone was just not very feasible. But when flash memory came along, that made that much more feasible and expanded the capabilities dramatically because flash memory takes a lot less power uh, to, for data storage as compared with, um, for example, a disk drive. So um, flash memory basically works by way of uh, write, writing data into uh, transistors. So there's something called a floating gate. So when you're um, writing to a disk drive, you're magnetizing portions of the disk and storing uh, ones and zeros on that. With flash memory, you're taking transistors and uh, writing ones and zeros to a little portion of the transistor. So uh, transistors are much smaller and, like I say, use a lot less power. So they've been a huge part of enabling the whole mobile computing revolution that we have. Like, probably pretty much everybody in this room has a cell phone. So much of that has been made possible because of flash memory. And just an example of how, how dramatically flash memory has impacted things, uh, here's a picture of floppy disks um, transitioning from 1.4 megabytes to 4 terabytes. Uh, you can get thumb drives uh, up to 4 terabytes in size now. That's a 3 million times capacity increase, which is, like, incredible. I mean, if you think about that. So floppy disks were used, probably a lot of you students probably hardly even know what a floppy disk is, but back in the day, these were an important part of storing data on a computer. So it's it had a dramatic impact. Also on the lower left here, here's an uh, old laptop computer that had a, um, a floppy disk drive in it, and then the one on the right has flash memory in it. So you can see it's much thinner, sleeker, 
the prices have gone down, they're, they're cheaper, use less power. So a huge part of that has been flash memory. It's been a huge impact on the industry. And um, here's a little bit more about flash. Uh, so in the upper left, there's a disk drive, and it's transitioned to a, a, a device with chips in it instead of a rotating media that's magnetized. And then um, uh, this picture, uh, this image here, um, here, uh, this one, this is actually inside of one of these little micro SD cards. What you're seeing here is 16 layers of flash memory that are stacked up. So inside that little tiny device, it's about the size of your little pinky fingernail. You have 16 layers of flash chips, and you can get, as, as shown on this device, 200 gigabytes. And the one on the right, which is a little bit bigger, that's used internally in some of the modern cell phones, you can actually get a terabyte of data on that. So it's just an incredible increase in data storage. So flash memory has really had a huge impact on everybody's computing in the world. Um, one of the things that um, I've been involved with uh, that's been a part of uh, promoting my business as an independent consultant has been part of an organization called IEEE. How many IEEE members are there in the, in the audience? Probably only maybe nobody. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I'm a member of this. I think actually there's a lot of people who are not in the computer science or math department here. There's a few, but um, there's probably more people in the computer science department. But IEEE is a, is a worldwide organization uh, representing uh, computer science and electrical engineering. And uh, I've been part of this since shortly after I, I graduated from PLU. And they've got this program called the IEEE Milestones Program. And it honors uh, important things in his the history of technology. And I'll be talking about a number of those, and it kind of paints a story as to how technology has evolved over the years. And when a milestone is granted by the IEEE History Committee, a bronze plaque like the one shown here is created and put in some historically uh, important place. So the first uh, milestone I worked on was uh, for enabling flash memory. And I worked with Eli Harari, who founded SanDisk Corporation. And some, uh, I learned about the inventions that he had come up with that have provided the foundation for the whole industry. So it's pretty amazing friendship. This is a guy who's just really changed the world. And I got to work with him directly and find out about his inventions and get one of these uh, milestones uh, for the work that he'd done. And at the dedication event, I was with him and Gordon Day, who's the president of IEEE, uh, dedicating this milestone. So it's, it's one of these things that, when, once again, when I'm self-employed, if you get to know really key people, it's an important way to stay busy. So I've been uh, fortunately able to come upon different ways to promote myself and stay busy as a consultant. So if anybody in the audience is interested in being self-employed, make sure you get your fingers in certain pies and get to know interesting people, because you'll find that your path will be made a lot easier. So um, one of the things that uh, Dr. Hurry received was the uh, National Medal of Technology Innovation from President Obama in 2014. This is something that's given to a group of people every year in the White House. And some of the words that were used by Obama to describe what he had done were actually taken from the citation of the milestone that I worked on him with. So that was pretty cool. When I read that, I realized they used the words from that citation to help put together the things that he had done. That was a pretty cool thing. So anyway. Um, so, we've talked a lot about flash memory. I'll talk a little bit about the history of Silicon Valley. Now, there's another milestone for the birthplace of Silicon Valley, and that, um, that's based on a company that was called uh, Shockley Labs. It was started in 1955 um, in Mountain View, California, next to Palo Alto, basically right in Silicon Valley. That was the first company in Silicon Valley to make uh, devices made from silicon, which is the basis of all uh, integrated circuits and computer circuitry that's used today. And um, so the, the three inventors of the transistor, one of them, uh, William Shockley, the one in the bottom, who, by the way, is a controversial figure. I won't get into the controversy right now, but anyway, he was one of the three inventors. He's, he's the one who started Shockley Labs. And he and the uh, three inventors who did, did this work at Bell Labs in the late 40s got a no Nobel Prize. When um, he started this company, he was great at picking people. So he, he picked, really, the cream of the crop of the whole country with regard to engineers who were key in high tech at that time. But he was a terrible manager. So he grabbed, got this group of people who were really key in engineers together, and they all got mad at him, and the traitors, eight as they're called, all quit en masse. And so they quit, and um, so they, they called the traitors eight, and they left to form the first Silicon Valley startup. But anyway, this, this birthplace of Silicon Valley is interesting because 
th th like I say, this is the first company to produce these, um, these components in Silicon Valley. And um, as part of the milestone um, exhibit that's set up, uh, there's, there's a couple of key things here. This is a uh, transistor. And this is a diode. So these are two components, key components that were produced by Shockley Labs. So it's, these are like about 15 feet tall. So it's, it's a kind of whimsical um, exhibit that honors the birthplace of Silicon Valley. And I talked to you about the, the, the milestone plaques that are created. This is the plaque that was created for this company. There's a key portion of this that talks about some of the talented scientists and engineers initially employed there left to found their own companies, leading to the birth of the silicon electronics industry in the region and hundreds of firms in electronics and computing can trace their origins back to Shockley Semiconductor. So this is key because uh, Silicon Valley has succeeded because people get their start, they learn about a lot of things, and then they get an inspiration in starting another company. So that's been really the, one of the keys for success in Silicon Valley, people being willing to take a chance to go out, take an idea, and do something with it. So um, that, those tr that trader site that I mentioned, they formed a company called uh, Fairchild Semiconductor, and that was the first venture-funded company. So whenever you start a company, you need money. These people, uh, they looked around for some money, and they found money from a company back in New York State called Fairchild, uh, uh, let's see, they, they made photographic equipment. And so they, they funded this, they, they funded this company. And uh, the company was actually founded on October 1st, 1957. And I'll tell you in a moment why that's a significant date. But uh, all the companies that, uh, were started by its the employees who used to be at Fairchild are now called Fair Children. But the thing about this integrated circuit, some people consider it one of the greatest inventions of the 20th century. You're wondering, okay, what does that mean? Well, I'll, tr I'll show you. There's, uh, we've got the transistor here that was invented at uh, Bell Labs in 1948. There's this thing called the integrated circuit that had four of these transistors on a silicon chip, silicon die as it's called. And so the whole idea of putting multiple transistors on a piece of silicon is the key thing here. We have gone to the point where we are putting many tens of billions of transistors on a silicon die, like shown here. So this invention has really made the whole electronics industry, and, and um, it's just a very important invention. So um, that was the start of uh, Fairchild. And, or that, that is, they started in 57, and they came up with this invention in 1959. Now, look at that date, October 1st, 57. Three days later, Sputnik. Anybody know about Sputnik? You ever heard of that? This was a big deal. The world freaked out. The Russians, the Soviets, I should say, the Soviet Union, had put a satellite into space. They were the first ones to do it. People were freaking out, thinking, the Russians, they're going to have death rays. They're, they're going to destroy us. So people were really freaking out. Now, we'd already had the Cold War that was going on, but this really accelerated it dramatically. What it did is it caused a whole lot of people to become engineers, because they knew they needed engineers to, in, to counter the technology that it took to put Sputnik up. So the number of engineers in this country and the whole space program would not have been possible had we not been pushed into it by way of Sputnik. So the, the Russians were first, the Soviets were first, but this is a, a huge deal. It has ramifications to this day. So. Um, one of the things that, um, that the impact that it had on, um, back up to, uh, to Fairchild, um, they had uh, started, three days later Sputnik started, suddenly, within a few days, the government is calling on them, saying, you know, we, we need to electronics, we need something to counter Sputnik. And so this became a huge part of the business of Fairchild, and in fact, by way of the integrated circuit, that's how we made it to the moon 10 years later. It would not have been physically possible to create all the electronics that were in the Apollo 11 that brought us to the moon had it not been for the integrated circuit. Because things would have been way too much, it just would have been too complex. That's why the integrated circuit is considered such a key invention. So, um, so one of the things, part of that, as you can imagine, you put four transistors on a piece of silicon, things started accelerating, people were putting more and more devices, transistors on silicon. There's a thing called Moore's Law that came along. It's um, Gordon Moore is one of the traders eight. He's also one of the co-founders of Intel. He came up with an observation in 1965 that as the number of transistors were increasing on silicon, he looked at the, the numbers and realized that every about 18 to 24 months, the number would double. 
And so he postulated that this would continue to... We actually postulated... He, he gave it a name called Moore's Law. He didn't predict the future. He said, this is an observation. But people realized that observation was really key. And the reason it was really key is that you could develop a new product that maybe wasn't possible at the time you're developing it, but if you could rely on the number of devices on a piece of silicon to have doubled by the time that your um, product wants to come to market, then people would be willing to fund it. So it, it was really a, a, an economic thing that catapulted the industry and, and allowed people to design products that weren't possible at the time that they designed them, knowing that they'd be able to produce them by the time they could actually produce them. So it's, um, it was actually interesting getting the IEEE to uh, agree to this, uh, to Moore's Law, because they said, well, it's not a law of nature. <laughs> you know, it's not a law of physics. Of course it's not a law of physics. It's really an economic observation. But it's a thing that catapulted the industry, so it had a huge impact. So um, switching gears here, there's another uh, milestone they worked on called Shaky the Robot. It was the world's first mobile intelligent robot. This is a pretty interesting project I worked on. And um, for the dedication of this milestone, we um, created a video that I'm going to play, you for, play for you right now. Uh, we don't have audio. Um, whoop.
So, hope that was enlightening. It was a really fun project to work on because the team I was working with, uh, you know, they, they, like as was noted in the video, they were the first people to do robotics with intelligence behind it. You had robotics that were just mechanical devices, but something that actually had software running it. And the key thing was the computer vision aspect of it. So the, notice the camera there, the ability to, dis, to discern objects, to remember where they were. It was a very complex task. What it took was two mainframe computers hooked together and, uh, and the robot communicating wirelessly to them and getting uh, uh, signals. It was transmitting signals and also getting uh, directions on where it should move. So it was a very interactive thing. So you think it's almost like a computer on wheels, but it wasn't. This is long before a computer could have been on wheels. You had a mainframe computer running it, and uh, it was a mechanical device moving around. So it was a very, very interesting project. So um, this, this uh, shows some of those components, like the radio link to the mainframe computer, and the ability to do triangulation, and the TV camera. And then um, you see the, um, the cat whisker, whisper bump detector, so it wouldn't bump into objects. So it would move around and learn about its environment and build up a database that represented the environment that it had maneuvered in. And then it would, and if it would be tasked to find out what's the shortest route to get from point A to point B, it would use the data that was built up to determine that. And that technique right there is what's behind, for example, Google Maps. Like the video showed, whenever you do a map, uh, map software on your, uh, uh, like how many people use mapping software to get here today? I know I did. And to do that, that's based on the shaky technology. It's, it's pretty amazing. So, um, so this is another image of it and moving around. So you see some objects in there. So it would learn what those objects were, build up a database, and remember so that it could know the, the shortest route from point A to point B. And here's another picture of the uh, people working on, on this. This woman, she's often called the Lady, Lady Ada Lovelace of robotics programming. I'm not sure if you've heard of Lady Ada Lovelace, but she lived in the 1830s and 40s and is called the first computer programmer. Very interesting woman. So here's a, some images showing that, um, perceiving uh, what, it, what is being um, seen by the camera. So you've got the camera taking an image, figuring out how to turn that into information is a very key thing that was part of what, what Shaky did. So it, um, in fact, I've got a website uh, that I documented this information on called shakymilestone.com, but it talks about the techniques that were used to actually go from the photograph to information in the database that had learned about what it was seeing. So computer vision started with Shaky. And um, here's an interesting thing. Now, I, I started here at PLU in 1970. Co-ed dorms were a pretty controversial thing at the time. Now, they're a, kind of a given on campus now. But this shows you the time and the place back in 1970. In that same issue was an article about Shaky the robot. And a couple of the visitors to Shaky when it was being developed was Bill Gates while he was still in high school. Also, science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke. He wrote 2001 and a number of science fiction stories, science fiction books. And uh, so here's a couple of things that we talked about in that video. One of them is the uh, keep and lane scheme. So if you're in a car and uh, it's got one of those, uh, if it's got that software installed where you begin to get toward a lane and it moves your steering wheel so that you stay in the lane, that came from Shaky, as well as the Google Maps idea, like I was mentioning. And it's also used by the... Um, uh, the Mars rovers. All the Mars rovers on Mars use this technique. And that's really key because if the Mars rover ever flipped over while it's moving on Mars, end of story. That, that Mars rover will never operate again. And so you have to be very careful how you move around. So it uses the techniques from Shaky for that. Now I've got a video about this, but unfortunately we don't have time for that. I'd love to show it, but it's, it's a pretty cool video. But anyway, here's the, the Shaky design team. If we have time at the end, I'll, I'll show that. And uh, at the dedication event, we got most of them to come to that event, and uh, it, was a, it was a pretty cool thing. And um, what, one of the things in that little video, if you saw that little robot moving into the elevator, that's a robot called Relay. Has anybody in, been in a hotel where there's been a robot that delivered something to your front door, the door of your hotel room? I don't know if you've ever seen that, but there's some in a number of hotels around, around the country, and they use this... Um, uh, it's called the Relay Robot. And um, the guy who started that company, um, he calls it uh, the Grand Center Shaky because it's built on the same technology for that robot to move around. So another milestone they worked on was called the Lunar Laser Ranging Experiment. This was um, 
A picture on the left, this shows uh, something that's called a retroreflector. This was put on the surface of the moon by the Apollo 11 astronauts 50 years ago. And it's a set of mirrors that allows light to be reflected back. So what they did um, shortly after the astronauts left the moon uh, back in July of 1969, they started shooting a laser at the moon at this retroflector trying to find it because they knew approximately where it was, but zeroing in on it was really difficult. And so they were finally able to find it after uh, 12 days. Now you can imagine, here's what the problem is. You shoot a laser for about um, a couple of seconds. You're shooting literally trillions of photons. Now that, that photons, they, they started at three, quarter, three quarters of an inch wide and it spread out to about two miles on the surface of the moon. A tiny portion of those, of those photons hit this retroreflector and got reflected back. They were able to detect five or six photons reflected back uh, from that, finally when they were able to zero in on it. And by using the, the speed of light, they were able to determine the distance to the moon. So this was first done in 1969, 12 days after the Apollo 11 moon landing. And an interesting side story of this is they were able to, okay, they were able to measure accurately the distance of the moon, and they still do this regularly. They've been able to determine that the moon is moving away from the Earth at about an inch and a half a year. Also, through some other techniques, they were able to determine that the moon has a molten center. Some very interesting fallout from that. But it turns out the laser that was developed for this was actually developed in response to this threat from the Soviets that they were going to try to shoot our satellites out of space, you know, try, try to blind them by blasting them with lasers. So we were developing our own laser in, under the assumption that they might start a war by way of doing that. So um, they, that was the ulterior motive of developing this powerful laser. But they were able to also use it to measure the distance to the moon. That ended up being a very beneficial thing. So this is a dedication event this past August 1st. And the, the, the black gentleman to the left of the plaque is the key guy who worked on the, um, the, the laser that was successfully able to, um, to measure that distance. So um, another interesting milestone is um, the Amtex videotape recorder. And I talked about a lot of the things that uh, tonight um, that uh, are interesting developments. So many of these things have actually come out of the defense department. Like Shake of the Robot, the funding for that came out of ARPA, which is the Advanced Research Projects Agency, now, now called DARPA. That's the, uh, basically a defense-funded pro uh, project. And so that, that money was used to fund Shake of the Robot. Now, I know, uh, so, so many things that have been developed in technology have been developed, in, uh, developed indeed in response to defense needs. Um, an interesting thing that happened during World War II is the Nazis had developed a techni technique for magnetic recording. And they were actually able to play recordings of Hitler in different cities in Germany to give the Allies the false impression that Hitler was in a particular city. So this was one of the techniques that they were using, because we couldn't figure out where Hitler was, because he appeared to be speaking in one town and then another town. So we thought we were tracking him, but this was actually a real um, a technique that the Nazis were using based on magnetic recording. We found this out when, when we, um, at the end of the war, and we found the technology, that technology was used to develop the, uh, the Ampex uh, audio recorder. Now, Bing Crosby heard about this. Anybody know who Bing Crosby is? Probably only the only people in the audience. Anyway, he was a very popular singer. But he heard about this, and he loved to play golf. And he hated to have to be, to stick to a schedule where he'd do a, a recording on the radio at a particular time of day. So he'd like to be able to record it another time so he could do his golf game. So he funded Ampex <laughs> based on this technology that came from the, from the Nazis. And that was the basis of magnetic recording, which we use for disk drives and so many other things. So it came from the Nazis and, and developed Ampex and other companies. And um, another thing, uh, who's heard of Dolby noise reduction systems? Probably you, you see that at the end of movies all the time now. Anyway, Ray Dolby is the uh, second person on the left here. He worked on, at Ampex on this uh, video tape recorder, which was introduced to the world in um, 1957. And when it was introduced to the world, it, um, it was introduced at the National Association of Broadcasters, immediately received a standing ovation because people were stunned that you could do video tape recording on magnetic media. It was just like a, a, it was just a very dramatic thing. And Ampex had a huge market for this for decades. So it's some interesting history behind Bing Crosby and Ray Dolby and, and this uh, audio or this um, yeah, audio recording and video recording by Ampex. So that, that got a milestone. Another milestone was for the disk drive. 
Those developed in San Jose in 1956, and the, uh, the disk drive in this um, mainframe computer here is the stack of 50 platters here. So 50 platters that are 24 inches in diameter held about four megabytes of data. 1956, the very first disk drive. You can see how big it is because it's being loaded onto an airplane here with a big forklift. So back in the day, disk drives were huge. That, that got a milestone as well. And one uh, milestone that uh, dedicated earlier this year is for the Dialog online search system. This is something that's still in use today. Now, we think we're searching all the data in the world with the internet, but that's, that's a fallacy. There's an awful lot of data that you can't get to, an awful lot of data that a lot of money has gone into creating. And so there's a system called Dialog that allows access to that if you're willing to pay a fee for it. And companies like in the pharmaceutical industry are willing to pay that money to get good research. Um, you know, they don't want fake data. They want real data. And that's what, that's what you can get using this Dialog search engine. And this is actually um, uh, a search engine that was uh, working well over two years before internet search was working. So we dedicated th that earlier this year. Uh, another one that will have its anniversary in eight days, its 50th anniversary in eight days, is the inception of the ARPANET. Now, the ARPANET preceded the internet. And ARPA stands for Advanced Research Projects Agency. That's the same, as, same agency that funded Shaky the Robot and, uh, and other projects. So the first transmission for the ARPANET was from UCLA in Southern California to SRI in the Bay Area. SRI is the same place where um, Shaky the Robot was developed. So um, 50 years ago, shy eight days, that first transmission occurred. Of course, the rest is history. We've got the internet all over the world. But th this is a milestone to honor the, um, the initial ARPANET data transmission. Another one was for the HP 35 calculator. Now, we take for granted handheld calculators these days. I will always remember a day in 1972, I was in the UC Center having dinner. Somebody came over to my table, showed me an HP calculator, and I just could not believe it was physically possible. Because you could instantly do it like a logarithm, square root, all sorts of functions in the palm of your hand. That afternoon, I'd been in the physics lab in Ramstad Hall using a device very similar to this one, and to do a square root took about 12 seconds. So you'd punch in the numbers, you'd see that you'd wait about 12 seconds, the number would come up. So to see the HP 35 in action was just astounding. Now we take handheld calculators for granted, but it, it was quite an invention at the time. And Steve Wozniak was working for Hewlett Packard then, and ended up also working on the HP 45, which is the follow-on. Of course, Steve Wozniak is one of the founders of Apple Computer. Uh, another milestone was something called CPM. It was uh, launched the personal computer revolution. It was an uh, operating system that uh, ran on uh, Intel microprocessors. Intel at the time, they had invented the microprocessor, which is the heart of all computers today. Um, but at the time, they thought it would only be good for like embedded systems. They actually used them a lot in um, running traffic signals. So they thought like, you know, little things like traffic signal operators, operation, things like that was, was really where uh, microprocessors should go. But uh, Gary Kildall taught them otherwise. He created a personal computer based on a microprocessor. And that really launched Intel. I mean, they were already doing very well, but they, they were losing to the Japanese in the memory industry and trying to make it in the microprocessor industry. And this taught them that it could actually power a computer, not just a smaller device. And uh, some upcoming milestones, ones that I worked on, are for the Apple I, Apple II, and Macintosh. And those will be dedicated next year. This is an interesting uh, project because I got to work with Steve Wozniak um, for the his key history of the Apple I and Apple II and the Macintosh team for the Macintosh. There's about 45 people who worked on that team. It's a really fascinating project to find out the behind the scenes stories about um, the Macintosh. Another one that's coming up, now the things I've been talking about pretty much all been in Silicon Valley, but something that's gonna touch you here in Washington State that's gonna be dedicated next year is something called the gravitational wave antenna. Have you, anybody heard about this? That This place called LIGO over in Hanford, Washington? Have you guys heard about that? This is a fascinating thing. So there's actually three of these places in the world. There's one in Hanford, Washington, another one in Livingston, Louisiana, and another one near Pisa, Italy. Each of these arms is over two miles long. And these are very, very sensitive detectors that can detect what's called a gravitational wave. Now, Albert Einstein, was, with his general theory of relativity back in 1915, theorized what gravity is. You ever think about what gravity is? I mean, what holds us to the Earth? I mean, how does gravity work? Nobody knew. 
He theorized that it was a ripple in space and time, but nobody could prove it. Nobody, no, I mean, it was an interesting idea, and it worked well with his mathematics, but nobody could prove it. But a fellow in 1972 at MIT came up with an idea of a device to be able to measure a gravitational wave under the assumption that it existed, because we didn't know it even existed. So he theorized about this, and it wasn't until around 2015 that it was actually physically possible to create a gravitational wave antenna. So the technology had come together by that time. And in 2015, two detectors, one in near Hanford, Washington, and one in Louisiana, virtually simultaneously detected the same thing. And the reason uh, two of them were key is because you don't want a false positive. So when the two of them detected this virtually simultaneously, that proved the existence of gravitational waves. Now I say almost simultaneously because if you can imagine 1.3 billion light years away, two black holes are colliding. So 1.3 billion years ago, two black holes were colliding. Now, a black hole is a huge collection of mass. So there's a huge amount of gravity. And two black holes colliding is a phenomenal amount of gravity, and it creates monstrous gravitational waves. Gravitational waves so significant that they can travel for 1.3 billion years, 1.3 billion light years worth of time and distance to reach Earth. Now, it's not going to reach each one of these antennas simultaneously because, you know, it's, it's going to hit one and the other. So the fact they're able to detect it virtually simultaneously proved Einstein's theory. This was a really big deal. In fact, Rainier Weiss uh, received, along with two other gentlemen, the Nobel Prize in 2017 because his theory for proving Albert Einstein's gravity theory was proven correct. There's another location um, outside of Pisa, Italy, that's also been able to detect gravitational waves. And this map shows the different places in the world where these detectors are. So we've got the, uh, we've got the LIGO one in Hanford, Washington, and LIGO in Livingston. These are the ones that first did, uh, measured these gravitational waves, detected them. Then we got this other one, uh, Virgo, in Pisa, Italy. And other ones are coming online as well. So that'll be dedicated next year. I might be back here in Washington. We're trying to get the governor to come because it's going to be a really big deal because what is gravity? Answering that question was a pretty big deal. So I've worked on a lot of milestones, and I've had a lot of fun, and it's kind of become my hobby. So that's my story. Thank you very much. All right. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Bird? OK. We've got to have a question out there. Is that somebody over here? Oh, sure. Okay, I'll repeat the question because it wasn't on the mic. So uh, right, right out of school, I was uh, hired into NASA. What I did is, I actually, my very first job was for a company called Aerojet General in downtown Tacoma. But I found out very quickly about the aerospace industry that it's very volatile. So they lost the contract, and so I was working there for about two months, and then the job went away. So I decided, since I had lived in California before living here in Washington, I wanted to return to California and go to Stanford, and, and I knew there was a lot of job opportunities there. So I interviewed with some companies. The one at NASA was really cool. I thought that would be really fun to work on the space program and different aspects of that. So they were one of the places I interviewed with, and I accepted the job there. So it was just my attraction to, to that part of the world and NASA needing the... Uh, the labor for developing software. Any other questions? Back over here. So what's next? What's the next big thing that uh, you see down the road? What's the next big thing? Well, let's see, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I've talked about a lot of technologies here. You know, it's, it's a really interesting thing. I, I'm often asked that question, particularly with regard to AI, artificial intelligence. Now, as we saw from Shaky the Robot, that launched a whole lot with regard to AI. In fact, you know, I didn't even talk about all the things from AI. The, the, one of the people who worked on that was chair of the Stanford um, Computer Science Department for 10 years, and he wrote two books on AI. The guy I worked with is a fellow in four different organizations and is one of the most cited people in all of artificial intelligence. So AI is affecting a lot of things. So, and it can be a very controversial thing. Is it intruding on our privacy? Is facial recognition a dangerous thing? These are all difficult questions. So frankly, 
I think what's going on is the technology is getting so advanced, we're creeping in to other areas, such as what is uh, socially responsible, what, what is impinging on, on people's rights. So I think the world of technology is vastly changing because it's becoming potentially dangerous. So I think there's a lot of thought that needs to go into that. I don't have any magic answers, but I certainly see a lot of people kind of freaking out about that. Other people saying everything's okay. I'm not sure. I'm kind of on the fence on that. So I think we are in a, a, a very volatile time right now, and the future will tell how much good and bad is going to come from all this stuff. Any other questions? Ah. Okay, the question is with, uh, I've been uh, kind of an entrepreneur and done consulting, what do I see the benefits? Well, one of the things I mentioned that I really like is being able to be my own boss. And as you get into w workplaces, there's always politics. I'm sure there's politics in the different departments here at PLU. I mean, it's inevitable. People work together, people have egos, I mean, it's inevitable. So I've been able to kind of divorce myself from that. And to me, that's great. I don't have to deal with that kind of stuff. Now, that's the plus side, or that's at least one of the plus sides. A minus side to that is the fact that you've always got to be looking for work. So you've got to be self-promoting. I've always got a business card on me. Uh, I, I try to do everything I can to promote myself. I'm part of the IEEE group um, organization, and I'm a part of some other organizations, and I've got a website. So you're always kind of promoting yourself, and you're never sure you know, if you hit a low time in jobs, you're never sure, okay, is that the end of it? And, and usually what happens is they'll get a bunch of jobs at once. So it's always can be a little bit unnerving, so I think you have to have a lot of self-confidence. It's probably easier to start when you're younger, when you don't have other obligations, like before you're married and things like that. So if you're fairly independent that way, it's probably a safer thing to do. But then the downside of that is you might not have enough background and experience for somebody to be willing to hire you. So there's all sorts of trade-offs. So it's, I think a lot of it is self-confidence and a little bit of guts. And, um, but I think the benefits for me have been the independence and also working for, I mean, I've worked over, over 200 different entities, 200 different companies. So that's been fascinating. So I, I've dabbled in so many different areas. So to me, that's been a really fun part of it, the, the variety I've seen. Any other questions? Ah, Natalie, hi. Sure. So the question um, was, uh, working, all this work with milestones, how has that affected my career, basically? Yeah, it definitely has. For example, that work with Eli Harari on the first milestone. I learned so much from him. I mean, this, this guy, he's got about 200 patents. He created the foundation of the flash memory industry with some insights dating back to the 70s. I mean, that was incredible. So it gave me a real foundation and knowledge to make me that much more capable when I work uh, other projects related to flash memory. So that, that's been part of it. And, um, well, the reason I do it, frankly, is I think it's fun and I love history. So that, that's, that's why I do it. But then the benefit for that is like what I just mentioned. And I think it's, it's I mean, it's an, if you do di things that are different from what you might normally do, there's always serendipity. Things will happen that you're not expecting. And I, so I've met people like, for example, in that Shake of the Robot project, I've met people who I've interacted, interacted with on other things. That they'll ping me about some question. So I've got a lot more contacts and people I can contact and people will respond to me. Important people will respond to a question from me. So that's really cool. So I can find out some key information if somebody wants to find something out. So for me, it's been beneficial in the foundation of the knowledge I have that I can call on pretty quickly and have it very reliable. So. That, that's an important part of being able to be competent as a consultant. So I think it's helped in many ways. Plus, it's fun. <laughs> Any other questions? I guess there's a lady back there. Do 
in a word, yes. <laughs> so, so the question was, um, are designer babies taking it too far in, in a nutshell? Yeah, to, to me that's like, I mean, I think the, the beauty of having a child, as I found out firsthand, is you don't know what you're going to get, and, and you'll get something that's wonderful. I, I could not have designed my, either of my daughters, and they're so different from each other, and that's really great. So designer babies, that's like, it's, it's kind of like, if, if I was able to do that, I, or if I was able to, I, I would guess that somebody trying to do that might want to kind of clone themselves or something like that, or, or the things they like about themselves or their friends they want to clone. That's kind of weird. I think, I think it's better to have variety. I mean, variety is the spice of life, literally. It's, it's so, so like getting something that you're not expecting is, is a wonderful gift. And, and trying to predict what you're going to get, that's like opening up the gift early or something. I'm not sure that's the best analogy. But anyway, so basically, no. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, one more time, Brian Bird. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bird. Uh, your donations have been helpful here, and uh, I think we learned quite a bit. And obviously, what interests you, I think, interests a lot of us as well. Thank so you. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Appreciate that, everybody.